We tend to look at classic cars through rose-colored glasses, okay? Cars like the Corvette Stingray, 60s Mustang, Jaguar E-Type, BMW 2002, Pontiac GTO, these are all amazing cars that I would love to drive. But I was surprised when I found out that a stock Honda Odyssey Elite, a family minivan, has a 0-60 to 60 of 6.7 seconds. That's faster than a Mustang Cobra. I know 0-60 to 60 times aren't the golden standard for a car's performance, but as time goes on and cars get faster, more reliable, and better all around, I can't help but wonder which modern family cars are faster than legendary sports cars. In this video, we're going to take a look at five family cars that are not only faster than legendary sports cars, but some that can stop faster, handle better, and generally outperform all of them. Before you blow up my comments talking about, yeah, but older cars are better, uh, I know, okay? It's cool if you think that too. I'm not making this video so I can crap on old cars. I love old cars. I would totally rock this thing. I just think it's amazing how far cars have come. So that's why we're gonna see how some iconic sports cars stack up to modern family vehicles. And we're gonna do our best to compare these cars without ever leaving my apartment. Let's kick this video off with one turbocharged grocery getter that can rip through a parking lot faster than most others. The Chevy Equinox has never been the most exciting mid-size SUV on the market. In fact, I don't think we've ever mentioned it in one of our videos before. But the 2018 Equinox 2.0T is a lot quicker than you might expect. For the third generation, they ditched the standard V6 from the previous car, made the car slightly smaller, and dropped a two liter turbocharged four banger in it. The quick revving engine and reduction in weight made for a serious improvement in performance. And thanks to that all wheel drive system, the 2.0T gets up to 60 in 6.6 .6 seconds. A 6.6 .6 second zero to 60 time would be respectable for a sports sedan 10 years ago, but that time coming from a crossover is pretty impressive. It's a freaking Equinox, okay? Like, it's not even a high-end crossover. We're talking about a middle-of-the-road car for people who coach high school water polo. The turbocharged and intercooled inline four produces 252 horsepower and 260 foot-pounds of torque, all mated to a nine-speed automatic transmission with a manual mode. So how does it compare to one of the most iconic exotics of the last 40 years, the Ferrari 308? There's no way a schlubby crossover can beat Magnum PI's car, right? But it does! The Equinox 2T beats every version of the 308, the GTB, GTS, Quattro Valvole, most by over a second in 0-60 to 60 times. Both cars have 252 horsepower at their highest trim level, but the Equinox has half the amount of cylinders as the Ferrari. That's amazing. You could argue that the Ferrari came out at the end of the Malays era when power was choked by emissions laws, but I would still love to see the Equinox and the 308 on the track going head to head. As far as handling goes, the Equinox most definitely feels more numb than the Ferrari thanks to the power steering, but 308s were notoriously prone to understeer, especially at high speeds. Actually, let's talk about suspension for a second. The Equinox 2T has McPherson struts with tuned springs in the front paired with four-link independent suspension in the rear. Again, we're talking about one of the cheaper SUVs on the market, and it's got suspension that you would see in a high-end sports car in the 80s. That's pretty rad. The difference being, though, the Equinox is tuned for a more comfortable ride instead of performance, obviously. The Equinox might not handle or feel as sporty as the Ferrari, but 30 plus years of improvements in suspension technology, uh, I think it kind of levels the playing field. Scion XB people have been the butt of jokes for a long time, and I'm not here to roast them. I'm here to toast them instead. This blocky boy is not only more practical, it's faster than one of the most iconic muscle cars ever. The second gen XB came with a 2.4 liter Toyota inline four option that made 158 horsepower paired with a five speed manual. Despite being one of the most divisive vehicles in the last 20 years, it's actually a really great car and very practical, very easy to get in and out of. The XB has a quarter mile time of 15.8 seconds, but that's the same as a 1968 Ford Torino GT. Even though it's not quite the car that Starsky and Hutch drove, they drove a Gran Torino, the Torino GT was considered fast, nimble, and a pretty competitive muscle car that could roll with the big dogs. Even with a two-ton curb weight, the 1968 GT model came with a 390 cubic inch V8 that could bring it up to 0-60 to in 7.7 .7 seconds. But 
While the Torino GT and the Scion XB have the same quarter mile time, the Scion actually has the GT beaten 0 to 60 with a time of 7.4 seconds. Pretty impressive. I'm not trying to write off the Torino. They are sick cars, and of course there were better engines that you could option. But it's pretty surprising that a Scion XB, a car that you regularly see clapped out, driving without hubcaps, can beat a classic muscle car at the drag strip. The Torino GT was known for having great handling, especially at high speeds. So if they raced on anything other than a drag strip, the Torino would most likely beat the XB in the twisties. Although I will say, it would be a hard fought battle. Just saying, those XBs can whip them. One of the most boring yet surprising family cars on this list is the Chrysler Sebring Limited. That's right, the car that everyone's aunt drives is a sleeper. For years, Chrysler was getting a lot of flack for making boring, underpowered cars. They responded by making cars like the Crossfire, PT Cruiser GT, and a high-end trim level for one of their best-selling family sedans, the Sebring. The 3.5 liter V6 and the third gen Sebring makes 235 horsepower and 230 pound foot-pounds of torque. Almost a perfect horse torque, equal horsepower and torque. Sure, it's not that impressive for a heavy family sedan, but when coupled with a six-speed automatic transmission with close gears, it brought that car up to 60 in 6.8 seconds. Nothing to scoff at for a Sebring. You're gonna spit coffee all over your computer when I tell you that that zero to 60 time is faster than an Aston Martin DB5, AKA James Bond's car in Goldfinger. The Sebring is a full 1.7 seconds faster to 60 than the 64 DB5, the same model year that was featured in Goldfinger. One of the big reasons cars perform better nowadays is the tires. Tire technology improved light years in just a short amount of time. According to the managing director of Kumo Tires, quote, even the dry pavement traction and handling of the street tires available 30 years ago wouldn't measure up to the wet surface performance of today's high performance tires. That's pretty awesome. Tires are also lasting longer, becoming more puncture resistant, and new compounds make more grip than ever before. New passenger vehicle tires actually deliver twice the tread wear of the same level of tires 30 years ago. That's a huge improvement. It's worth mentioning that all the zero to 60 times of the classic cars we've been talking about were done on old tires that just couldn't hook. They could not hook up, and that's a huge problem. Power means nothing if you can't put it to the ground. On to the next. Minis have always been regarded as some of the most fun cars to drive. The Countryman SE All 4 has a 1.5 liter three cylinder engine with an additional electric motor. And it can beat most of your favorite muscle cars all while hauling the kids baseball equipment in the back. The inline three and electric motor make 221 horsepower and 284 foot pounds of torque, which combined with the quick launch of the all four all wheel drive system results in an almost too good to be true zero to 60 time of 5.9 seconds. I think that's faster than my Mustang. This is very impressive when you consider the Countryman SE is the heaviest Mini to date. 5.9 seconds is pretty quick, and I'm not just saying that because I'm from Central California. To put that in perspective, that's quicker than a Mercedes 190E Evo 2, one of the sickest cars ever made. The Countryman has almost a full second on the Mercedes, which has a zero to 60 time of 6.8 seconds. The Evo 2 was known as one of the best handling production cars of the time, so it would probably destroy the Countryman in any test other than zero to 60. With self-leveling air shocks in the back, the Evo had the highest cornering grip of any Mercedes at the time and one of the shortest braking distances of any car tested by car magazines at the time as well. I feel like out of all the comparisons, this is the one that really illustrates how far cars have come. The 190 Evo 2 was a homologation special Mercedes built so they could compete in Group A rally racing. But after being beat by the all-wheel drive Audi Quattro, Mercedes realized the Evo would probably be more competitive in DTM racing or the German Touring Championships. It racked up a ton of DTM wins and is regarded as one of the most dominant race cars of its era. The homologated road version is detuned to a degree, but I think it's crazy that a bloated Mini can beat it to zero to 60 miles per hour. The electric motor paired with the tiny three cylinder of the Countryman may help it off the line quicker, but the Evo 2 is still a legit race car and better in basically every other metric. Speaking of three cylinder cars, one of the most significant improvements that has happened in the last 40 years is engine efficiency. I'm sorry, did you think you were getting through this without learning? You're in the science zone, bitch. 
I'm not talking about gas mileage, which has also gotten way better. I'm talking about the fact that tiny three-cylinder engines are able to make as much power as top-of-the-line V8s back in the 70s. They weigh basically nothing, they're super fuel efficient, and they can rip. I'm talking engines like the 1.5 liter EcoBoost from the Fiesta ST, or the one from the BMW i8 that makes 227 horsepower. That's crazy. There are a number of reasons engines are becoming increasingly efficient. Old V8s didn't have the technology to regulate gas consumption. Each cylinder was fed the same amount of fuel no matter how much work it was doing, so there was a lot of lost energy. Nowadays, cars can turn off at stoplights instead of idling, which saves gas. Some engines can deactivate cylinders when the motor has a decreased workload. And most of all, turbos are being used in more models, making the combustion cycle way more efficient which makes it possible to get the same amount of power from a smaller engine. A smaller engine means less weight and more space in an engine bay, which is an efficient use of space. The EPA estimates that only 15% of the chemical energy of all the gas your car uses gets converted to mechanical energy. That's a loss of 85% from gas tank to the wheels. Just idling in traffic accounts for 17% of that lost energy, but most of it is lost through heat and friction. 62% to be exact. Every little improvement gets a percentage of that lost energy back, but we still have a long way to go. I still love the sound of a big block engine, but you can't deny how awesome these small displacement turbocharged three pot engines are. That's the, that's the end of my rant for now. On to the next. The Plymouth Barracuda was one of the very first muscle cars to ever make it to production. The Barracuda might have looked fast, but it was anything but. The 1967 Barracuda had a 0 to 60 time of uh, 13 and a half seconds. I'm not talking quarter mile time. That's a 0 to 60 from a muscle car. So what beats this classic muscle car? <laughs> well, most cars. But one little garbage bucket in particular, the first generation Chevy Aveo. This rebadged Daewoo has a 1.6 liter engine making 103 ponies and can crawl to 0 to 60 in 10.3 seconds, a full 3.2 seconds faster than the Barracudas. So that's, that's freaking bonkers. I love classic cars. I would love to have a 67 Cuda, even if it got embarrassed by an Aveo. Look, I'm not ripping on these cars, and I want to point out that by the same token, legendary sports cars from decades ago are better than some sports cars nowadays. The Porsche 959 can go over 200 miles per hour, and it was built in the 80s. Would I want to go 200 miles per hour in an 80s Porsche? Mm, I don't think so. But compared to a car we recently had in the office, the BMW M8 Competition, driving the 959 seems way more fun. Both are incredible machines, but the driving style is way different. Even though modern cars are getting quicker and more efficient, the feeling of operating a machine is what people connect to. And let's be frank, that feeling is disappearing. Having said that, let's look at some more butthole cars that can beat legendary sports cars. The PT Cruiser GT is equal to the 1976 Lamborghini Countach. The 2013 Honda Accord V6 EXL is faster than a Porsche Carrera RSR 2.8. The 2009 Altima SE is faster than a 1984 Lotus Esprit Turbo. The 2009 Nissan Cube is faster than a 1974 Dodge Challenger. That's embarrassing. What are some other cars that are surprisingly quick? Hit me up in the comments, let me know. Also, hit me up at Nolan J Sykes on all social media. Follow Donut at Donut Media as well. Um, cars are fun. Uh, be kind. I'll see you next time. Um, cars are fun. Uh, be kind. I'll see you next time. Great. I did it.